Hello, everyone. My name is Michał. I work at Akado Technology, and I'm going to talk about functional programming in Java and Scala. I will mostly show Java code, but I also want to compare some of those Java snippets with Scala ones side by side so that you can see the difference. And I will be honest, this is a talk about functional programming, but I won't, uh, won't talk about math. I won't show you any math here. I don't want to convince you uh, that functional programming is cool. I don't want to explain why monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. What I want to do, uh, I want to show some practical and applicable examples so that you can include functional programming as another tool in your tool belt. So imagine that you are part of a remote team that does contracts for various clients around the globe. And one day, a new client approaches you, and he's from Galaxy far, far away, and he heard about this thing called Twitter that people on Earth use, and he wants to have something like that in his own Galaxy. And uh, of course, we happily accept the contract and uh, promise to have a working prototype by the end of the next week. So we immediately go to our favorite coffee house and want to start hacking right away. It turns out that the main, fu main functionality, the MVP requirement, is to have a func functionality of followers. So uh, we need to show uh, for each user how many followers does this particular user have. And we are spawning our ID, and because we are programming in a coffee house, we want to use functional programming. So what does it mean to be functional? In a functional programmer. Most of you probably know the answer already. Uh, the usual ones are uh, using immutable collections, creating immutable types, uh, using functions, using functions that take functions as parameters and return functions, so higher order functions, and things like that. And we have lambdas and streams in, in, in Java since, uh, since Java 8 release, right? So th is it enough? Well, yes or no. Lambdas help us bring functions as first class citizens to the language, and uh, a higher order API. Uh, Java streams is kind of verbose, but it's still there, so it's better than nothing. But the main problem still is that the rest of the API have not uh, changed. So, uh, for example, we still uh, have mutable collections, and we need to use some external libraries in order to, to have immutable ones. So, the same thing cannot be said about Scala. So in Scala, everything is built into the language. We have immutable collections built into the language. Higher order functions are uh, le less verbose than, than streams. And of course, we have uh, like val keyword, which is also a, a, nice, a nice addition. And we have immutable types by using case class notation. And uh, in, in terms of basic functional programming, Kotlin is very similar to Scala, so the basic the basics are there. We can still create immutable types. We have nice higher, or higher order APIs and things like that. But there are some differences on more advanced levels, which I'll show you during this talk. So Kotlin and Scala are not very, very similar. At the end of the uh, presentations, I will touch upon I will touch upon those differences so that you are aware what are they. But I'm not here to talk you into Scala uh, or, or Kotlin. I'm here to talk about functional programming, and it turns out that we can use functional programming in Java today. There is this library called Waver, which has just been renamed in April from Java Slang due to trademark conflict with, with Java, of course. Uh, but there, there is this library, which, which is around since 2014. And we can do basic functional programming stuff uh, with that, but also some advanced, more advanced things are uh, also there. So all my Java code today will use <coughs> Waver. So Waver style. Programming functionally with Waver style. After including it in our project, we can have immutable collections. Uh, we still need to use Lombok or, or create immutable types by hand, but the rest of the uh, rest of the things are there. So higher order functions are, are less verbose than streams because they are built upon this immutable collection thing. And of course, functions are also also there. They are built on top of lambdas. So a small disclaimer, I'm a Scala programmer, so I picked up Waver very quickly because it uses ideas from Scala in order to bring them to Java world. But if you get lost or don't understand some, some code on the slides, just interrupt me, I will try to explain bet better. Okay, so let me show you how this, all those things can be utilized uh, in our project. So remember, we were tasked with creating a, a Twitter version with uh, followers functionality for a galaxy far, far away. So the first thing we need to do is to model our domain. 
So uh, our domain for followers will be just citizens of the galaxy, right? So abstract class with, with just a name. So we ha will have a citizen with a name. And of course, some concrete subtypes like civilian with a name, Jedi with a name, rebel, Sith also have just names. And Stormtrooper, which additionally has this Boolean flag, which means uh, if it's true, it means it's cloned, and if it's false, it means that it, uh, it's not cloned. So that's the whole domain, right? Five concrete subtypes and one abstract class, okay? And uh, of course, we also have this API to, to get them from the database. This is implemented by some other uh, team member of us on the other side of the globe. And uh, w as you can see, we can get the citizen by, citizen by providing the name, and also we can get the followers for the particular citizen, okay? So, and uh, the most important thing here is, however, that uh, both uh, functions return future. And <clears throat> the future is a waiver future. So this is not the Java one, it's waiver future, which models computation that provides a value in the future, or it may fail. So two, two cases for the future. When it completes, it may be completed with a success or with a failure. And this is the basic foundation for asynchronous programming. <clears throat> so uh, we are using it uh, here in our DB client method. So what can we do with that? Of course, we can just uh, spawn our ID. We are backend developers, so in order to test our API, we need to create a helper application, console helper, helper application. So this application will just uh, get the name from this console input and uh, will try to get the followers for this particular name. So as you see, and DB client gets citizen by name, we are just calling uh, this DB client function, and, and uh, then we get the future of the citizen. And then in IDE, we just press dot, press dot, and uh, try to find a method that will get our, the citizen, uh, us the citizen. So we don't want to have future of citizen, we want to work on citizens, right? And uh, there is a method like that, which is called get, so we just uh, use that, and repeat the same procedure in order to to get the followers, right? So next line would be uh, DB client get followers for this particular citizen, and then we are getting this value out of, out of the future context. So uh, we end up with a list of citizens, okay? So this is, uh, this is how we do things, and we have done well, right? Uh, well, not so much. What is the problem? Who knows? Sorry? Yeah, so the problem is that Future.get is a blocking call, so it's synchronous in nature. And when the user will use our console application or REST API or whatsoever, the thread will get blocked until the database will return the result, right? So until our DB client returns the result. So in order to, sh to keep our user happy, we, need to, uh, uh, we, we don't want to block anywhere in the code. And uh, it turns out this is a very, very common pattern in functional programming because uh, we, uh, when we do, when we do program in this way, we want to keep the values inside the context, in this case, in the future, as long as possible, until finally we need the final value. But uh, we don't unwrap this value as long as possible. So this is a very common pattern in functional programming. So in order to work on this value inside the, the context, we are using map function, because map function, it uh, it, is a func it takes a function that works inside this context, inside on, on the value of this, uh, of the real value of the citizen in this case. So we want to use this get followers because get followers takes a citizen, right? So we are mapping with this get followers function and we get future of future of list of citizens. So future of future is not something we would like to work on. So we use flat map in order to flatten the future, two futures into one. So flat map is, a, is also a very, very common pattern, so we are flat mapping the citizen with the uh, get followers, and then we get the list of citizen, and then we are mapping this list with the size function so that we get the future of integer. So no blocking calls at all, uh, that's why uh, we, return, we return future, okay? So what can we do with this future of integer? Well, and uh, before I answer you this question, I just want to show you that it's so popular, this flat mapping and mapping at the top in Java code, it's so popular uh, in functional programming that in Scala we have a syntax just for doing flat mapping and mapping and so on. It's called for comprehension. So those snippets uh, are doing the same, uh, the same thing. So again, what can we do with, with this integer get followers? At the end, in the REST API or uh, in, in the console application, we really need this uh, integer, right? How many followers does this user have? So uh, we 
uh, we may use something like for each, in, uh, which is a function on future in waiver. For each, it takes a lambda. So you can see in lines 22 to 24, there is, a, there is this lambda that we provide with the result, result name, right? So this for each takes this lambda, and this lambda is executed whenever the, the future is completed successfully, and then it's executed with this value that will be present in the future. This is not a blocking call. So we need to uh, use this in order to save that to the cache that, that is defined in line 19, and then this get followers function is not blocking because uh, because we just return the value from the cache. So whenever the, there is not, no, no value yet, we just return zero because we use this get or else uh, zero, right? So this is a non-blocking function, but it uh, requires us to poll every now and then in order to get the real updated value. And uh, I have used a hash map from Waver, not a hash map from, from Java, and hash map from Waver is a mutable, immutable one. So uh, put, what it does, it returns a new hash map. It also has this API for get, so whenever you want to get some, some key, in, this, in our example, it's, uh, key, the keys are citizen names, so uh, it returns the, an option. An option is another type in Waver, uh, which has two concrete subtypes. One of them is sum, the, the other one is none. So whenever the value is present, uh, it's, uh, return, it returns sum. Whenever it is not present and, and available, it's none. So that's why it uses API like that. So now uh, you can see how this works uh, from the console application. We are just providing the, the Darth, Vader, Darth Vader there, zero, zero followers, zero followers, third attempt, uh, 102 followers. So uh, as I said, we need to poll, but we are not blocking anywhere. So that's, uh, that's obviously better. So we use several threads in order to do that, because for each, whenever it's, it calls our Lambda, it uh, really spawns a new thread. And uh, no logs, no... Uh, creating uh, threads by hand. This is the power of immutability and the future type. And of course, there is another guy in our team that does this web application, and he knows about this API that, ne that needs polling. So uh, yeah, it looks like, like that. Whenever uh, it returns a new value, it just gets updated. So everything works fine, but one night, our telephone starts, starts ringing. And it, it turns out it's our client, and he's not happy, and he files a bug report. Turns out he thinks he has zero followers and it's not possible. Uh, okay, so we run to our desk, uh, fire up our helper console application, right, and run a query against production database because why not? So uh, we, so then we, uh, we input of course Darth Vader, Darth Vader, and and we see that Darth Vader has zero followers, zero followers, zero followers, and of, only after ten or so seconds it converges to the real number of one hundred and two, and obviously. Uh, Darth Vader is not so patient. So uh, what, what happened? Uh, of course, database on production is very slow. We need to think about that and fix that. But there is a real problem inside our application. We are modeling two things with one value. Value So zero means zero followers, but zero also means uh, we don't know how many followers are there because uh, we haven't really received any answer from a database. So this is a problem. And in strongly typed functional programming, we, we use uh, we use data to model everything. We want to use data to model everything. We want to use return types, which is data, to model our assumption, assumptions about the API. In this, in this case, we want to model something uh, possibly being there or not. And for this case, uh, obviously, option is a great candidate. So let's change our a API to have this option as, as a return type. So you can see in line 33, that we changed integer return type to option of integer, and there is just one more change. Uh, and in line 37, you can see that we got, got rid of get or else, because get returns an option, so we just use that. And that's all, this is all we need to change. And of course, web API um, needs to change, web application needs to be updated, and now, whenever none is returned, we get loading followers, and whenever sum with the real value is returned, we get 102 or the real number of followers. So now the user knows what's happening. Okay, so everything works fine, but one night our telephone starts ringing. And it's our client again, he's not happy and he files a bug report. This time he wanted to check how many followers does Obi-Wan Kenobi has, and it failed. So what happened? We run to our desk, of course, and fire up our helper console application and run a query against the production database again and in insert the Obi-Wan Kenobi as Darth Vader, Darth Vader provided. And we can see Obi-Wan Kenobi has loading followers, loading followers, 
10, 20, 30 seconds, one minute loading followers. What happened? What do you think? Well, we didn't cover the failure case. It turns out that our database client, what it does, whenever it, find, it, it cannot find the user, the citizen with that name, it throws an exception. A great design choice, but yeah, we, can, we should leave with that. However, you, you must remember that we can also have like, uh, technical exceptions, timeouts, and so on, and it, it also will fail the future. So we don't handle that. What can we do in order to handle that? Well, this is uh, where tri-type is uh, coming in. So we have this tri-type invader, which models computations that may succeed or fail. So again, this is very similar to option. It has two cases, two possible subtypes. One of them is success, the other one is failure. And the failure conveys the exception. Success conveys the real number, uh, real value. So remember, in strongly type functional programming, we want to use everything as data, right? So we want to model our assumptions about the API with data. In this case, the data is the tri-type. So let me show you, let me show you the example. How can, we, how can we do that? So this is the real, this is what we have so far, we had so far, so for each, and the cache, and the cache is here, so you can see, uh, you can see, yeah, uh, this is just map string to integers, right? And uh, in, order to, in order to see the exception, we need to get back to the synchronous call. So this is the synchronous call I showed you at the beginning. Just for a, just for a bit, we want to just uh, get followers synchronously, citizen name provided in the console application, and to string it, and we want to, of course, run the whole thing, and uh, yeah, here, and see what's, what happen what's happening. So when we provide Darth Vader, which is an existing citizen, uh, of course, this is a synchronous call, so we wait until the database uh, call is finished, and uh, only then we'll get the real number of followers. And when we provide OB1 Kenobi, the problem here is that OB1 Kenobi is misspelled. W should be capital, and that's, that's where uh, Darth Vader made a mistake. So let's see, there is an exception, our application uh, failed, our application finished, and let's uh, take a look at this exception. This is the last time you see an exception in your careers, because I will show you a trick that will get rid of this kind of errors uh, for you, and you won't be, uh, won't be seeing it anymore. The trick is very, very simple. The trick is that we use try from Vader, and we need to just wrap our call in the, in the runnable lambda, and that's all. So this is, this is what we did. This is the whole thing. We just modeled the, the computation that may fail with this try type, and the try type may be success or failure. So now Darth Vader should just, uh, uh, yeah, just return this success of 102, right? Because now we are wrapping it in, in a try. And so this should be success of 102 and Obi-Wan Kenobi should be a failure, and our application, I don't know if you can see it, uh, back there at, at the end, and we can see that there is a failure here. Uh, of course, we, we need to provide the better error names, but uh, the, the nice thing is that we have this exception, it's wrapped in a, in a failure, we can do more things with that. So that's how it, uh, that's how it uh, works. Okay, so now uh, that, that, that we know how this, uh, how this works, and we see some similarities uh, to option, we can move on and try to modify the result type, uh, as I did, as I did, uh, as, I want, as I want to show you in a bit. So the plan is that we need to update the cache type. It was string to integer, and uh, now it needs to be try of integer. So we'll, we'll be modeling this kind of what happens in our application. And of course, the return type in our uh, function will need to change from option of integer to option of try of integer. So this, the whole type will really model the assumptions about, uh, about the, uh, the API, all right? So this, uh, in order to implement that, so that you, you, you know how, what I'm talking about, is uh, this one here, very, very simple change. Uh, try of integer, so now our cache is, uh, is something different, that's why we, we get compilation error here. And the, the real problem is that for each, when you see the, the waiver documentation, this action that we provide this lambda is not performed if the resu result is failure, right? So we need to provide something different, and something different is, on, on, is incomplete. So incomplete, what it does, uh, it conveys the try. So our lambda needs to get the try uh, here. And followers, when we go, uh, look at the type of the followers, you can see that it's try of the integer. And that's, that's, all, uh, that's all we need, okay? So now, uh, now 
that we change the function signature, uh, we can talk about what it additionally gives us. So we, uh, we need two database call, calls in order to get the citizen, uh, the followers count, right? But we need to handle the failure only once at the end. So this is the power of not unwrapping anything from the future uh, context of future and pipelining the failures uh, uh, through the, the whole computation. So we are just doing data transformations on, on, this, the, on the things inside, but the failures, whenever they occur, will only be handled once at the end. So two failures or even more, but only one handling at the end if we need so. And this is our uh, web application, which is updated after our recent changes. So we are polling every now and then every one, uh, 200 milliseconds, and when none is returned, we still get loading, but when some success is returned, we get a uh, real value. When some failure is, uh, is returned, we just update the UI in order to hide the failure from the user. So it obviously needs to go through our UX department, but for now, let's assume that that's something that we, uh, we want to have. So as you see, the UI is really, uh, is really nicely compatible with the backend right now. Okay, everything works fine. But one night, our telephone starts ringing. And it turns out it's our client, and he's not happy with our return types in our application. But then suddenly we wake up, and it turns out it, just, it was just a nightmare. But, but then we start having second thoughts. So maybe this was a sign. Maybe we shouldn't be using such cryptic return types in our application. But what about modeling everything with, with data? What about modeling all the assumptions about the API uh, with return types? So we want to have a cake and eat it too. And it turns out that's where algebraic data types, ADTs in short, come into play. So we still can have a cake and eat it too. Uh, we need to model our return type as algebraic data type. Algebraic data type ADT is a very simple concept. Uh, it's some type or product type. Product type is a, is a type that consists of several types. For, uh, for example, one or several types. For example, when you define a class with string, boolean, and integer, then you just define the product type of string, boolean, and integer. On the other hand, sum is more similar to enum. So it can be either something, one type or another type or, or, or another type. So that's, and of course, they can be mixed together. And of course, we have already seen some examples of ADTs in, the current, uh, in our current project. For example, Stormtrooper is a, is a product type of string and Boolean, and Citizen is a real sum type because it can be either a, a civilian Jedi, Rebel Sith, or Stormtrooper, but not two things or th uh, three things at once. And of course, try and option are also uh, sum types. Try, success or failure, and uh, option, sum or none. So let's try to model our result type as ADT. Uh, what we want to have is one, we want to have a public uh, interface, like uh, normal remote followers data is our ADT, and it's, it's our sum type in this case, and uh, we want to have four concrete subtypes. First one, not requested yet. Whenever we haven't really requested anything from the database and loading, we have requested but haven't heard uh, from them yet. And then failed, which is a fail, failure of the computation of the fetching with the some error message, and fetched, this is a success case, so we fetched the followers, and we have this integer, how many followers uh, does this user have? So this is our model, okay? And now we need to change our, our signature of the function. So remote followers data is something that we want to re return from our function. But how can the user of this application use this kind of return type, because it's just an empty interface, right? It's a marker interface, no methods no whatsoever. So how the user, how the client of our API uh, can use this, this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, return type? It, before I answer you, uh, let's, let's uh, find out about uh, the very similar case that we have inside here. So how tried followers in our Lambda with uncomplete is a try of integer. And in order to provide this remote followers data implementation, we need to create another type based on the, uh, of the real type of the, of the try. So let me, uh, let me show you what I, what I mean. We need, to, we need to use something like pattern matching. So we need to see what type is this tried followers, try of integer. And based on, based on the, whether it's success or failure, we need to create a different type. 
uh, if it's a success, we need to create fetched. If it's a failure, we need to create failed with the, uh, with the message, error message. So pattern matching is a technique that works well with ADTs. Uh, case is for uh, each some type concrete type, right? So whenever we have some type of two types, like in this case, we will have two cases. And uh, patterns inside with these dollar signs are something to extract uh, fields from this product type. And uh, let me show you how this looks in the code, because it may be a little bit cryptic. cryptic. So uh, when, you, uh, when you want to uh, have something like that, in, the, in this cached followers, what it does, if we get citizen name here, what's the type here? This get, get, what, what does get return? What kind of type? Optional, right? Option of what's inside this option? What's, what's the type of tried followers here? Yes. So we get, uh, we, we get an option. So at the end, we just need to, pr to, see, uh, to get loading. But the value inside is tried followers, which is a, which is a, a try. So what we need to do is we want to try, uh, we want to match on tried followers and have several cases. So uh, again, when you see the type of tried followers, you can see that it's try of integer. And now we want to build a string out of, uh, based on the value of try, right? So we have a first case. First case is a, is a success. And this dollar sign just extracts the value from the success. Success brings an integer, right? And now we need to have this function from integer to string. So we just do it uh, old school way and uh, have something like that. And the second case is failure. So in, whenever this try is a failure, we also extract with this dollar sign and have an exception passed to our lambda. And then we can have a like format uh, error, right? Error and exception to string. So that's, that's all. And then uh, we'll be able to just print, print that. So again, this whole, uh, the whole uh, highlighted piece of code uh, gets a try, uh, try of integer and returns a string. So we can decompose the, the try and have, uh, and have it, uh, a decomposed version uh, converted to, to the string. So that's how it works. So now that we know how to how to really do this kind of uh, this kind of technique, the pattern matching, we can use in our console application. We can use the function that get remote followers uh, return, which uh, the function get re remote followers, which returns our ADT type, right? So we get this remote followers data in line 46, and then we need to pattern match on it. And this is a sum type with four different concrete subtypes. So we need to have four cases. When it's not requested, we just provide a string uh, for loading the same. And whenever it's fetched, we extract again in line 50 with this dollar, dollar function, and we pass it to object to string function. And when it's failed, we just pass it uh, to the lambda, which gets an error message and formats it in a nice way. And in Scala, uh, both ADTs and pattern matching are built into the language. So sealed trait is an interface which can be defined only in one file. And as you see, match uh, pattern matching is not a library, but it's built into the language, it's language uh, syntax. So everything works fine. We use ADTs and pattern matching, but one night our telephone starts ringing again. And this time, it's not our client, it's our user. And it's, uh, the application uh, has become very popular in the galaxy. It's so popular right now that it started to be used for political, uh, political uh, propaganda uh, purposes. So, the followers count functionality is a propaganda tool right now, and our user is part of a rebellion, and he doesn't like that Darth Vader has so many followers because majority of them are clones. So we go to our computer and check the current logic behind this followers count functionality, and it turns out that the user is right. It's, it's, it's a bug because what we do is just we return the size of the list. So we, uh, we return the, the size of the list of citizens. So it's a bug, we need to fix it. In order to fix it, well, let's use another thing from, from Waver. So the, the list is a Waver list, again, not the Java list. So it has something like count. This function count, what it does, it takes a predicate. Uh, that, that's a function that takes, takes an element and returns a Boolean, whether this uh, element satisfied this, satisfy this predicate or not. Uh, so in this case, in, in this case uh, it just goes 
goes through all the lists, whole, the whole list, and executes this predicate against each element. And it's counting all the truths, okay? So we can use that, and let's think about this lambda predicate function that we, that we need to implement. So it needs to return a true uh, if the citizen is civilian, Jedi, rebel, or Sith, and it needs to return true whether there is a, uh, the citizen is a stormtrooper and is not a clone, so the clone flag is false. So let, uh, can you help me with that? So what can we use in order to implement this lambda function, this predicate to pass to count? What technique? Yeah, pattern matching. Thank you very much. So pattern matching to the rescue. Yeah, we can use pattern matching. So we need to we, we need our predicate to be something opposite to what I showed right now because it's simpler. You can see that there, there are also default cases. So let's go through the code. Line 18, we can see that if this, uh, this citizen is a stormtrooper and uh, we extract the first value name, but we don't use it, and then we extract the second value true, which should be true. So this case will only apply whenever this is a stormtrooper with the second flag as true and only then we return false. And of course, if this is, this is not satisfied, we just go to the line 19, which is the default case, which means we, no matter what we uh, pattern match on, uh, always return true. So that's the whole functionality implemented using pattern matching and account function from waiver list. And uh, of course, obviously the same ca the thing is implemented, can be implemented in Scala using built-in collections. It's very similar, a little less verbose. Okay, so almost, again, uh, everything looks fine, but one night, our telephone starts ringing. And it's our client this time, he's not happy, and he files a feature request. So he is not happy with how our application started to be used as, uh, for political purposes. So he has an idea that we need to implement in order to make the application less political. So we run to, uh, to our desk and, and, and fire up the, the galactic Twitter application that we wrote and go through all the tweets and we see that some of them are really rather political. Okay, so user is right. We need to implement this new feature. And this new feature is called censorship module. So we need to implement this feature in order to make the Twitter, uh, galactic Twitter less political. Uh, okay, so the first, uh, first requirement is that uh, we don't need to, we don't want to delete tweets because it's not cool. We want to slightly manipulate them, okay? And the user, of course, provide, provided us with the initial list of filters that we need to use. And one filter uh, consists of the condition, which says whether this tweet should be manipulated with this filter, and the manipulation algorithm. Uh, so if the condition is met, what kind of algorithm should we uh, use in order to manipulate that uh, particular uh, tweet, okay? So uh, both of them are, are, are there, and the, the initial list consists of eight filters. The details don't really matter. What matters is that we need to uh, pass every tweet through this list, but only do at most two manipulations. This is the, the third requirement. So we have this initial list, and we tried to do like very, very naive first approach. And of course, we can use this if uh, blocks, right? So if the condition is met, then we need to manipulate the tweet, and of course we need to keep an eye on manipulations count. So we need to increment that, and then check whether we have really met this, this, this manipulations um, censorship maximum uh, or not. So this is the, the whole block of code. You are not supposed to read that, but as you can see, it's a big block of code with mutable state and, and lots, of, uh, lots of ifs. So can we, can we do better? It turns out we can. So in the strongly type functional programming, what we use, you, you, we tend to use data to model everything, right? So we can also use data to model our, our algorithms. In this case, we want to model our censorship al uh, algorithm using data. And sensor filter, as I said before, it can be uh, really modeled as a data. So it has two fields, and both of the fields are just Java function uh, types. Types. So the first one is tweet to boolean, which is a predicate, the condition that should be met if you want to manipulate the tweet with this, this particular algorithm. And the second one is the algorithm itself, so function from tweet uh, to tweet. So what can we do with such a type? It's just a type, it's just a piece of data, right? So what we can do is we can, of course, generate the list of, date of, of this, this kind of sensor filters. So this is a real Java code, real, real Java code. Look at all, all those and dense and, and predicate logics, but uh, yeah, it's very nice, it's more readable, so all the filters are on one slide, and uh, it's still just data. 
So can we execute a list? Can we execute a list? Yes, we can execute a list. And uh, it's called folding. So this is a technique that we use in, or in order to turn one structure, in this case, a list, into one final value. In this case, we want to have the censored tweet. And in order to turn the list of free sensor filters into one value, we need, to, we need to provide the initial value, so the original tweet, and the algorithm that takes the, the tweet and the currently processed element from the list and uh, gets another, returns another tweet uh, as a result. And then this, this uh, result is passed to the second element. This function is called again. It's uh, folded again, and so on and so forth, until we get the final uh, value. So this is just a list of steps, and the original tweet just passes through them using the function that we, uh, that we provide. So in order to give you some perspective, let's try the example on ints. So we have a list of uh, three ints, four, six, and three, and we want to fold it using the function, that the folding function, that what it does, it takes two ints and returns the sum of them. So it, the, the function turns two ints into one int. And when you provide the initial zero, we go, uh, we, we execute this function for the first element, second, and third, and we get output uh, one value. In output one value, so uh, the whole list of three integers were folded, was folded into one value. And in waiver on lists, we have something like fold left. So this is a function that we can use. It takes two parameters. The first, first one is the initial value, uh, so the zero element, and the second one is this by function, so function two in Java eight nomenclature, and uh, this function takes the current uh, result, current aggregator value, and the currently processed element, and returns a new value for the aggregator, so that we can fold the whole list into one value. So in our case, what we want to do is we need to provide this function, right? So we, w we know that we have original tweet as an initial value, and then we need just we need to define this function too. So this function needs to uh, take the current, current uh, current tweet, currently processed tweet, and currently processed filter, and return a new tweet so that it's uh, pushed into the next step. And as you see, this is a very simple uh, piece of code. In lines 103, we just uh, check whether it should be manipulated. If so, we return the manipulated version. If not, we return the original one. So the whole thing is then, uh, sorry, the, the whole thing is then folded into one tweet. But we need to keep an eye on manipulations count. So in order to do that, we need to uh, introduce a new uh, data type. It's called sensor status. It will have this tweet, original tweet at the beginning, and uh, also it will have this manipulations count. So what we need to do is we need to um, slightly modify our apply filter function in order to take this uh, manipulations into into account, right? So right now, in line 104, we need to also check whether this manipulations uh, is smaller than max censorship manipulations. If so, we return a new sensor status with new manipulations count and a new uh, modified tweet. And else, we just return the current status, okay? So everything is final, no mutable state, and uh, folding allows us to have this kind of uh, piece of algorithm without any mutable uh, variables. So this is how the whole algorithm uh, uh, that uh, the whole algorithm for censorship module is implemented. This is how it looks like. So this is uh, the alternative version of the uh, whole block of ifs uh, that I show you at the beginning. So this is uh, pure, func pure functions in, in full in full glory. And what's cool about that is that it works fine and is configurable and flexible. So whenever rebellion starts winning, we can just uh, we can just have a feature switch, one change. Uh, we just turn empire filters into rebellion filters and we are done, right? So just the, the filters, list of filters, defines the logic for our application. Okay, again, everything works fine, but one night our telephone starts ringing. This time is Uncle Bob. The Uncle Bob says that we don't have tests in our application. And why is it so? So of course he, he is right, we should think about tests in our application. And uh, this is the part where uh, having everything modeled as data pays off, and I will show you why. Because standard unit test approach for the, functional, for the followers count functionality, so the, we, no, we don't want to, uh, to uh, count clones as followers, this functionality, uh, when we want to write tests for this particular functionality, we would need to provide examples, like, like this one. So this is standard unit test, uh, two unit tests, 
for this far particular functionality. One checks whether we, uh, we count stormtroopers and uh, not the clone one, and second one, whether we don't count clones at all, things like that, right? So we would need to provide many more of that in order to cover this very, very simple functionality, right? Because it's very simple functionality. So what can we do in order to, to do that? It turns out that we can test, we can have tests, not as a list of examples that we as programmers provide, we can define the properties of our data, the properties of our algorithms, and then get the, uh, the co compiler, the computer, and the framework, waiver, mat uh, waiver test in this case, to generate the tests for us. So this is like per perfect for lazy programmers, right? We just define the property, and then thousands of tests are generated, which are you know, trying to figure out this empty lists, not empty lists, and corner cases, and so on and so forth, based on that. So we can easily have thousands of tests because we model everything as data. So this, uh, this, uh, has, this is how it looks like. And I want to, of course, I want to show you how it looks like in, this, in, in the code. So ask me questions whenever you feel something's not really uh, understandable. I will show you how to test this uh, particular one property of our algorithm. The property is that clones should not be counted as followers, right? So let's, uh, let's see what we need. We need to have this arbitrary value of Stormtrooper first. So what arbitrary is used for? It's used for generating arbitrary values. So the framework will use our definition in order to define, uh, in order to generate, uh, randomly generate some, some cases. So we will use, uh, no, we, we won't use that. Uh, we use arbitrary integer. So this is a generator of random integers, right? So it is minus one, 1,000, two, 2 billion. And then we just map this integer with the function that creates a new stormtrooper, which has this uh, clone number plus ID to string. And of course, it needs to be a clone, right? So this is arbitrary uh, stormtrooper, which is a clone. And very similar thing can be done for the non-clone non-clone, this is one, just one value, generation of one value, stormtrooper, and of course the flag needs to be set to false. So this is uh, the generator for our arbit arbitrary stormtrooper values, clones and non-clones, and then we can have arbitrary lists of them, very simply, uh, so we want to have an arbitrary list of non-clones, uh, clones, sorry, this is just very simply, arbitrary list that takes the generator for one, one particular uh, clone, right? So this would be generating lists of zero and 1,000 with different kinds of uh, clones, and uh, the same for non-clones. So this is all the setup we need in order to define our property. And then we need just to define the property itself. So we just have property def, and what our property should be. So some, uh, sorry, count followers, this, this function that we are testing, this is the implementation we are testing, for clones, for the, for the joint list of clones and non-clones, should be the same as, so what, this is a property, you see? I'm not providing an example. What should be the property here? Count followers of non-clones, thank you very much. So this is the name of our test, our property, sorry, and then we just need to implement this property for all possible things from clones and non-clones, such that C and C, clones, non-clones, are uh, some, uh, sorry, count followers, C, append all, non-C. So this is what is in the string, but in the code uh, should be count followers uh, and C. And then we need to just need to check that and assert that it's satisfied and that's all. So we just uh, created our property. Now we are running the test. It will generate, uh, it will generate some 1,000 of, of cases. We can see that the test, the test passed, and 1,000 tests were generated for different corner cases. So this is how the property-based checking looks, looks like. Okay. I have a question. Excuse me. Yes, uh, question. Yeah. Is it a good idea to use arbitrary data because you said that it can be an empty list? If it is an empty list, it will not satisfy the condition. You will not uh, test it uh, 
non cons uh, will be five and cons will be zero if you pass, if you have bugs or not. And if that fails, are, how you will be sure that uh, the test fails because of uh, wrong data or because of the wrong implementation? Whenever, whenever the fa it fails, it shows you which kind of, uh, with which data was passed uh, when the test, when the property failed. I see, but if you use a automatic building system like some continuous integration or something where the test should not fail, it will fail in some yeah. condition. Okay, so, uh, so that, that's, a, that's a very nice question. So this is randomly generated, so that's the problem, right? Uh, but at the beginning of each test, you can see the seed, okay? You can see the seed. And then you can just reply on your local host with the same seed, and, and you get the same failure. Do you work for both Okay, so now, again, we, we just have the list of arbitraries, clone and non-clone, non and then the list of it. We can, of course, have some more things and uh, generate better lists, better, uh, better arbitrary values, but that's all. And then we just need to define their property uh, with the, this, kind of, uh, this kind of code, as I show you in the... Have they implemented shrinking? Is, is the, the question is, have they implemented shrinking? And the answer is not. No. Not yet. But this is... Uh, okay, we'll see. But it's not yet implemented. Okay, so now everything works fine. The telephone is not ringing, and we can sleep happily ever after, right? We have tests, everything. So this was Pragmatist Guide to Functional Geekery, starring Coffee House Programmer, Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, and Uncle Bob as guest star, directed by future type, which models values possibly available in the future, option type, which models values that may or may not be there, and try, which models potentially failing computations. All of them can be treated as monads because they have this flat map operation. Special effects by, by algebraic data types, which help us deal with more complex reality. Pattern matching, will help, which helps us deal with ADTs. And of course, property-based checks, which help us write more tests with a smaller uh, piece of code. And the screenplay is available at this GitHub repository. All the problems I've uh, shown you in the presentations are there with comments. And uh, of obviously, there are lots of different things that are more than just that. You have both Scala and Java implementations of the same application, so you can see side by side what this, what's the difference. You can, you, can have, uh, you can see web server, how is it implemented in HTTP in both Java and Scala. How is the pattern matching implemented uh, here? Uh, why remote data is a functor, and how did I use that? And of course, type class pattern, which we use in Scala, and how it helped me decouple the code from annotations. And pimp my type pattern, which we also use in Scala, how it helped me do a nice predicate logic inside the censorship module. Uh, I encourage you to look at the code. And uh, of course, this is a reference slide for you. And in Scala, everything is built in, but in Kotlin and and in Java, we have libraries that provide us the same functionality. So the good news is that, is that you don't have, we don't have to switch languages in order to start using the, this, this, this kind of techniques in our day-to-day -day, uh, job. So that's the good news, right? My name is Michał. This is my blog. This is my Twitter handle. I work at Akata Technology. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Have a wonderful conference. And remember to model everything as data. Thank you very much. Do I have time for questions? Yeah, okay, one question. Of course, it's me. Uh, <laughs> well, Thanks. I need to address this decade-old question about the pattern matching, because when coming from the object-oriented world, uh, you are forbid to use uh, casing about the type of the object. This is kind of instance of, of the object, and it's forbidden by all the books you can read, and now you just introduce uh, to us the pattern matching and told us that is the best way to implement it. What is your opinion about that? Isn't there a better solution where you can combine the object-oriented uh, design and the functional design so you should not case these things? So case is pattern matching. It, it's it's over, all over the place in Haskell, in all functional programming, uh, pro programming languages. Because what it helps us do, it helps us decompose the, the, the types. So we are using data to model every, everything. So we need a tool to decompose that. And instance of is a kind of cold smell. But in th this case, it's very similar. And it's normal comment from, from a Java developer. And it's, it's a normal thing. But it's, it's still statically typed. You can still have, for example, something like when you forgot, forgot to case something in Scala compiler will, will just have an error, for example. So it helps you uh, not write an, an, any bugs. 
uh, yeah, this, you know the problem case. is that if you introduce, an, introduce a, no, a new type, you need to add it to the case and to every case where you switch. Yes, about. and the compiler will help you uh, do that because there will be error everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes, over here. Hi. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, code uh, in our company that's written with uh, functional Java library. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see they're pretty similar. I've been yes. following it for some Functional Java time. is something uh, alternative to, to Waver. So there are several, several of, of, of I was wondering if libraries. at Okado you have done any uh, benchmarks, especially JMH micro benchmark of the, uh, especially of the GC pressure between the two libraries. No, no, we haven't tested. We, we don't really, uh, we, we, in, in my team we use Scala, so we don't use Waver. Uh, I just show Waver as a technique, but I suppose JMH, we should JMH all, all, over the, all over the place. I haven't seen any benchmarks about that. We are at the beginning of the road in, in, in Java, so we, we still need to, uh, to think about those things. And why you chose the latter? Sir? Why you didn't choose functional Java? Uh, so, yeah, I just, just chose Waver. So this is not about Waver. This talk is not about Waver. It's about techniques. So, uh, good, thank you for the questions. Remember that there are also other libraries out there. You need to test them before you use them. But there are sev uh, several techniques uh, that are covered by those libraries. The same for Kotlin. Uh, there is a li library called Functionale, but also Waver is for Kotlin. So you can still uh, have those. Functionalities. Okay, I don't have time for more questions, unfortunately. But uh, please uh, grab me at the Okado booth, and I have stickers for you uh, with some lambda, uh, lambdas, and, and uh, different stuff. So come join me here. I, I will share them with you. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you.